Greetings and salutations, travelers. Welcome back to the Inn of Planar Crossroads. And, as always, welcome back to our Around the Hearth discussion. We are here to discuss neutral good this time in our alignments. And we've already discussed all the lawfuls. You can look at those if you would like. And disagree with us vehemently in the comments, or compliment us heavily for our wisdom and perception. But uh, either way, it's okay. Just like, comment, you know, thing. Uh, anyway, before we get into that, announcements. Always less than five minutes. You can time us. Here we go. Uh, as far as announcements for the Interplanar Crossroads, I announced last time and announcing this time that uh, based on feedback that we've gotten through our polls, we're going to slowly introduce the 3D stuff into our um, whole repertoire of things that we're doing for the IOPC. Um, oh, I am working more on the... Oh, uh, By the time this comes out, I'm hopefully going to be talking with the people that do my website for me. The IOPC.com, there is a website for the Interplanar Crossroads. It's just, I'm not very good with websites, and so it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Uh, so we're going to try and put a little bit more focus on that through this coming year. I announced that in the other video of announcements that I did, uh, and hopefully by the time this comes out, there will be marked changes for the positive in it. So we'll see. Uh... I think that's everything for now. Do remember that in the dis discussions we're doing cosmic alignment, not personal alignment or things along those lines. This is about cosmic level alignment because personal alignment is a whole different thing. So anyway, uh, that's what I've got for announcements. Dan, what you got? Hey everybody, I'm Dan from Avenue Studios. And we are on YouTube, Rumble, and podcasts everywhere you can find them. Uh, we finished our Cogent series that wrapped up New Year's Day. So check that out if you're interested in Cogent. And we do Open Legend actual plays. And uh, we'll be coming out with some... I don't know exactly when this one will come out, but we'll have a Druid's Table on some Open Legend content coming out from one of the, one of the main guys in uh, the Open Legend community. So I'm very excited about that. I've actually got a play test tomorrow with him, so... Keep your eye out for that. We'll be on Twitch hopefully soon. And I did just think about if you want to join us through Patreon or Locals, uh, we just started giving uh, monthly VTTs. Jacob makes virtual tabletop maps. So every month he releases a map and everyone gets to vote on what they want him to make. So it's another little perk if you join our little forest family. So that's me. The little forest family. It's like a little yeah. bunch of elves out there hopping around. Something like that. Well, like hobbits, <laughs> but okay. probably hobbit. Actually, hobbits is a good. Yeah, that's mm. fair. All right, and then Thank Levi you. has a spotlight for us. A channel called Deadly D Eight. They make stuff about Pathfinder Second Edition and have fun animations. They've actually done an uh, interview or two that was a little more long form, but core of their content <laughs> is animations and information yeah watch awesome. a few of their things i think i i liked the, some of their animation stuff they did so fun yeah, stuff it's a good time and uh I, I still think it's funny that we spotlight people that are that have uh a few multiples higher than us of uh, <laughs> subscribers but hey doing it anyway everybody needs some love yeah yeah, <laughs> and they just happen to be people I know, or watch their stuff, or it's it's, it's sporadic. <laughs> yeah, chaotic good. We're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's see. We've got neutral good this time. So, travelers, sit down, get comfortable. Warm yourselves by the fire, take your preferred beverage in hand, and join us as we discuss Neutral Good. And it's Levi who's starting us on Neutral Good this time, because we discussed it. Well, I said yes. that he would, so that's what we're doing. I we made it work. <laughs> made it work. Okay. Neutral Good is kind of the stereotypical hero alignment um i'm going to give 
specific example, it's the neutral aspect on a lot of characters is always at least lightly debatable, but a fun and famous one is Geralt of Rivia. Riv Rivia, yes. Mm. I wanted to add an extra syllable in there. <laughs> uh, in general, he mostly follows the laws, uh, though they're not as stringent as in some other cases, but it's mostly following the law unless the needs of good prevail. Which I think is about where neutral good should sit. Of, like, generally deferring to laws unless you kind of need to for, in this case, the greater purpose of good from that sort of character's perspective. Yeah. So, for you, for you nerd heathens out there, that's The Witcher. So. True. I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Comment below if you did not know. <laughs> if you didn't know... Then comment below. If you did know, then God no. Also comment below. Also comment below. <laughs> Find another reason. Find another reason to comment below. So there's probably something. Yeah. If you did know, te comment below when you did know for the first time. There you go. How about that? I like that. Anyway, uh, I can see that, and I definitely agree that mm -hmm. the the stereotypical most heroes, most protagonists, are going to be characterized as neutral good. Um, this this is true from everything from Naruto in both the anime and the manga to uh, not so much Tolkien, but you know, in in a lot of other things. Uh, there's just so many that can be said, hey, that's a neutral good character, or that's a neutral good character. And I think this comes from the, uh, this stems from the idea that people like to think of themselves as neutral, just good in general. And that's kind of what people call the neutral good. It's the goodest of good type of people is how they tend to say it. Uh, I don't personally necessarily ascribe to that idea, but uh, cosmic alignment wise, Neutral good is very much a uh, loving, for, very forgiving, very loving, you know, stuff like that. And, and that's what you usually end up seeing. But really, that's, on a cosmic level, that's just saying somebody's good. You're not mm. really telling me what makes them neutral. You're telling me what makes them good. Uh, and so, I think a, 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 for, for cosmic level neutral good to look at it and say, uh, like The Witcher was a good a good one. Most characters are going to be presented that way because most people can identify with that mode in, the, in general. It's a lot easier to take a neutral character and then make decisions with them. So someone who's not overly attached to the law of, or order and also not overly attached to chaos and you know freedom over everything. And uh, I think a, a good character from fiction for this is one of, is that old classic Robin Hood style character. He's very much a character who is neutral good, and it's probably where our fast one of the reasons we have such a fascination for it in modern uh, modern storytelling because of how popular Robin Hood was, or characters like him, where there was this neutral good aspect to them. They just did good, and it didn't matter what anybody told them, they just did the good. And while that's admirable in some senses, it doesn't necessarily answer all the things about cosmic neutral good. We do see a good example here for Robin Hood in that sense, though. Because he, he would obey the law, but he was a noble and would obey the law, but he can't obey the unrighteous laws of the land. Mm -hmm. And so he, he as a person, what is very much law uh, neutral good. And it's different than what we see from like Captain America in the Civil War thing or, or stuff like that, because Captain America is very much 
he does want order. He does want order. He promotes order. Whereas Robin Hood doesn't necessarily promote order over chaos. He, he just wants he just wants everybody to be okay and everybody to chill out and if stuff get back to normal. That's what Robin Hood would like. Mm-hmm. And stealing from the rich to give to the poor. That's a good thing that he's trying to do. He's trying to take things that have been stolen from these people and give them back to them by stealing. Right. And so we see a uh, something that's, like I said, different than what we see with the Captain America example from Lawful Good. Yeah, I like... Um, I, it's a great point with Robin Hood, because I do see a lot, if you like Google the nine-point images, Robin Hood will be showing up as chaotic good a lot. And mm-hmm. I definitely think <clears throat> you make a good point, because I've... I heard one good description too with the stealing from the rich is that he doesn't even think it's theirs. So he's not even stealing it. He's not stealing the rich's money. That's the poor's money that the rich, that the the, the taxes took, unjust right. taxes. So for him, it's a law that does not promote the good. So I think a big difference like between lawful good, we had talked about using law law is the best way in which to bring about the good for a neutral good character the good what they define as the good is the most important part so if the law helps them do that fine as soon as it gets in the way there's no qualms about throwing it aside that's that law does not promote this moral good that i hold above excuse me above everything else so they're very comfortable switching back and forth. Which I think is another reason. I think that's how a lot of people tend to live their lives. That's why we connect to it pretty good. It's like, you know, there's all kinds of laws in the books that we break that just don't make any sense. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like talking in elevators. <laughs> well, there's some of those things. Uh, I mean, in real life, you, you literally can't obey all the laws that they have because you don't. Right. You, there's too many. <laughs> You just can't yeah. obey them all. You and, can't find out what they all are, even. Because like, when you look <laughs> into it, you see the exact code of how it's written that is often kind of ambiguous, but then you need to know how judges have ruled on it, mm-hmm. and then you need to know specifically how the judge you would be taken to would rule on it. Yeah. To yep. fully follow. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the way that we run precedents as part of law. In Right in our current judicial system. But that's beside the point. Right. Uh, a lawful evil particular. character loves that nuance. <laughs> yeah, a lawful evil character will go to the trouble of learning all those laws so that they can find all the loopholes. Or yeah. at least find all the loopholes and not worry about the laws if they've got right. a loophole for it. Uh, but as far as the neutral portion, there's that lack of attachment to, the, to order. Not necessarily mm-hmm. to the laws of the land, but to order sure. as a cosmic idea. Um because going back to the to the Robin Hood example we sometimes forget how Robin what time period Robin Hood was in like mm. you didn't do what he did and be lawful right you were that was treasonous what he was mm-hmm. doing was treasonous and it, it wasn't like oh he's just a, a renegade type kind of thing and you know, it's kind of romanticized now or something like that. That's not mm-hmm. how it would have been in that setting. In that setting, he would have been treasonous and characterized as evil. And all of those things and was in the story. And that shows that there was less regard for the order that was trying to be established and more, re- re- more interest in the good that was to be served by serving the good. And so... The a good way to look at neutral, I guess, would be to say good for good's sake. Mm-hmm. And that's very much something that you would see for for neutral good. Now, chaotic good is going to be kind of different, mm-hmm. uh, I would think. But you, this one, the neutrals are in some ways some of my favorites, but in some ways some of my least favorites. To mm-hmm to mess with as far as alignments 
because spoilers for when we get to neutral, true neutral, uh, there's true neutral is actually very rare. True mm -hmm. neutral is very mm -hmm. rare cosmically. Uh, well, not cosmically, but individually. Like if you put neutral on your character sheet, that's that's not usually how it's going to end up playing out in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it is actively difficult. Yeah, it is it is actively difficult to be true. It is it is harder to be true neutral than it is to be lawful anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that's for neutral. For neutral good, it's actually pretty easy to be neutral good. Mm -hmm. it, it's easy to play, but it's hard to ascribe cosmically. Because on the one hand, you have order that serves the good. Like, you have lo you have demonstrable lawful good that you can, can work with. And you have demonstrable chaos, demonstrable evil. And you have demonstrable chaos that is actually working towards the good. Arguably, kind of not efficiently, but, you know, it's working there. It's trying. So you have your chaotic good and you've got your lawful good on each side of this true, of this neutral good. And they kind of ride the line. And I think that's why people like, kind of like we're saying, why people like them in their stories. Cosmically, riding the line is not always a good idea um, with cosmic alignment. But because we're trying to focus a bit more on how this is going to affect players and how they play, putting neutral good on your character sheet gives you a pretty good, pretty good onset, and you're in good company. Yeah, Fun you is always intended. Right. Easy playing, be a normal adventurer. You're probably good. Right. Yeah. And so run around, help people, break the law a little, follow a law most of the time. <laughs> Yeah. If you get maybe. to a place with unjust laws, break them all the time. Yep. Yeah. Like, you don't have, and you don't have to have qualms about anything. It's just... Just be good. You have that goal. I had... Um, Kristen played a neutral good character <clears throat> along when I was playing my lawful good, and it was... That was interesting. I mean, she fell into a natural... It was her first character, so it was a nice... It's a nice alignment to start in. You probably, like we're saying, naturally fall into it. One thing that helped her is she just... She had a personal, her character had a personal moral code, code that she followed, kind of based off her deity. And as long as she was heading towards that, she kind of played a witcher type in that she was kind of standoffish, kind of a cold character. So you don't have to be super nicey nice, but she always did the right thing according to her personal stance, which was contrasted to my character who had his his whole identity was in his deity's law, good, the law of good that he followed, and that was what he did. Whereas Kristen's character was, she'd do some naughty things sometimes, but it helps someone, you know? It helps someone who's in trouble, and that's that's just the right thing to do. So, she that I think she played it very well. I think that I think, think that the um, the idea of it because it's so ubiquitous with how things are portrayed, picking one specific person, I mean, we picked Robin Hood, but picking one specific person out kind of is like, well, just pick X protagonist. So The, the right. hero archetype. The hero archetype, yeah. Pick that I <laughs> person that goes through the hero's journey. Yep, I was bouncing off of that. I said I had another Star Wars one. A lot of people were throwing out Luke Skywalker from the old three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As being neutral good. Uh, I think he starts neutral good. Yeah. I think he goes to neutral, uh, to lawful good in the end, but I think he's, but when he becomes a full Jedi, I think he goes to lawful good. But on his way there, I definitely think he's neutral good. Mm hmm. So, that's a pretty safe one. On, on right. my standards. Yeah, and that's Hero's Journey. I mean, you can clock the whole thing to it. <laughs> yep. So you can do you can do it that way. Um, I think that when you're when you're looking at it cosmically in your campaign, there's several deities you can look at. Uh, we shouted out Zon Kuthon last time, and while we could talk about Saren Ray this time, 
she's basically the um, the goodest of goody the goodest of goods in Pathfinder. I I'm actually not a super awesome fan of Saren Ray because I think she's presented she's neutral good, but she's presented as being so hopeful that all these other evil deities are going to turn from their evil ways. It's like you're a you're a freaking deity. Why are you think you are literally cosmically aligned with neutral good? Why are you thinking you're going to win over Asmodeus? Seriously. <laughs> it doesn't present her in a very intelligent light. Mm. But uh, that's just me looking at it from a cosmic level. Uh, if... Although, let me put the other side. What if <laughs> part of her cosmic alignment is that forced hopefulness? Forced what if that hopefulness... hopefulness... Right, like, the idea being that part of her idea of redemption is that is, like, part of her domain. It is part of her spirit to regardless hope against hope that there is a way, even when she, in her logical brain, knows it won't happen. Like, part of her being as an entity is that hope. Hmm. I can... Right, because there's the idea that her followers also have that, even though it makes more sense in her followers than it makes sense in her... <laughs> Yeah. Right. And that might actually be it's it's dumb in her, but that's because she is the archetype for her followers to follow and it makes sense in them. Yeah. I can un I can see why they've got it the way they do. I just don't To clarify, <laughs> not saying you have to enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that there's an argument for it. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the argument. Uh, it would it would also make if that's the case. Now, interesting. Find that uh, that's something to actually think about if you're going to bother with deep lore in your campaign setting. Mm. Is good so powerful that it overpowers the deities and their logic and will? Because the implication there is that good is such a force that it overpowers the will of a literal goddess. See, but I'm also saying that evil would do the same. Right. That even though a, a deity or law or chaos, mm -hmm. right? So that, I thought, like, and, and then that these brings up axes. The, yeah, that, br that brings up the idea in your setting are those forces so powerful that they overpower the individual will of a, even a deity? And if so, then there really is no free will in your campaign setting because the the dis the the law and chaos and neutral and good are absolute well so there's when discussing free will there are degrees and types of ways there's like full free will which means that there is nothing constraining your free will whatsoever uh, some people could argue that that is literally impossible because physics, uh, though that wouldn't be as true for, de like, in the earlier discussion where it's like, there are constraints on you that, like, don't affect your moral decisions, but they are there. Some people would say that alone means that there is not perfect free will. But then there's also that these alignments push them to a certain perspective but then they, within that perspective, have some amount of free will to make decisions and think about how they value exact minutia, but they don't have broader free will than that. I could see, too, <clears throat> as a degree of free will, to become the deity, you have, kind of like what Levi was saying, you have to completely embrace this. And that is what, what ascends you to that so at lower levels you have the freedom to a degree to decide but to become something more than that to go beyond and this is talking about limited deities too that you could ascend okay. to deity that you you have to then embrace it right. to get to this next level you an odd variance on power corrupts yep. mm. well you see it's like um their persona the way that the deities are presented is that they're personifications of these domains like mm -hmm. like 
they embody these things, right? So if you have that in your setting and you've got your neutral good that we're looking at, it, it, sh it would be something to think about for your setting. Mm -hmm. Because what we run into is omnipotence versus omnipresence, omnipotence, uh, omniscience versus limited deities. And limited deities are very much something that the Pathfinder settings, Dungeons and Dragons settings, all these real settings have uh, instituted fairly solidly. Because it makes mm -hmm. for it makes for easier storytelling. It's oh lot, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more uh, open to playing around and having fun, and that's what you're doing in these games. Uh, having that universal will being present makes it tricky to try and say, "Hmm, it, are you an embodiment or are you just?" a slave to that thing. And so right. I, think, Although, uh, I think if you're looking just at Galarian or just at D&D, they're just embodiments of those aspects. Don't over, don't overthink it. Yeah. Right, no one right. took, we're, we're overthinking it. We're overthinking. Don't ruin yes. your game with our overthinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so unless you have fun overthinking, you yeah. know, <laughs> well, that's why I said, don't ruin your game over it. If right. it's fun, you want to just hang out, overthink, uh, though there is actually the point that if it is that they are an embodiment, it kind of makes sense that Saren Ray, because it makes sense that it can actually realistically work out in the mortal realms to hope against hope for some people. Because for people who seemed like it was clearly, obviously, never going to work, sometimes it works out. That embodiment going to the divine realm, well, it stops making sense because they're all also embodiments. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, I don't know. Uh, as far as lore stuff for it, I get why they did it. I'm not going to yeah, fuss too fair. much about Saren Ray. I like <laughs> more the other deity that was brought up, Shaylin. Because Ooh, she Shailen has a fun. reason to hope. She has a reason to hope for her brother. She hopes against probability, but not logic, that her brother will return to his senses. Hmm. Debrog or whatever his name was. Comment below if you've watched my video on, on uh, Shaylin and Zonguthon. And comment, to prove so, comment his actual beginning name. Mm. Uh, but he went off, and, and that's actually where she got her Ransur. Her, her, her favorite weapon is actually his weapon that he took with him and she took back when he came back and he had... Uh, attacked her and it's an interesting dynamic he won't actively hurt her he won't actively go after her and hurt her and she won't actively go after him and hurt him now there, there's a lot of conflict between their followers but she won't per she uh, he being a lawful evil still won't just outright attack his sister Shaylin there's something in there and so she has reason to hope because they are limited deities, they're basically just really, really powerful spirits, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. They are, have it, there is that glimmer there for her. And so she, her hope makes a lot more sense than Shaylin's hope for Asmodeus. Especially when you look into Serenry, Asmodeus' Serenry. lore. Saren Rays, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, so I like that dynamic there, and it can show that in your settings, and in your cosmic alignments, uh, especially since most of us deal with limited deific figures in our settings, you can have those interplays, those that interplay between this alignment and that alignment, and those people most aligned with that, not necessarily wanting to actively fight against this other person, because they either just like them or they've got some sentimental attachment and it, it demonstrates the idea that lawful evil does not mean merciless necessarily it means that they they have things they care about mm -hmm. so that neutral good portion of Shaylin makes a lot of sense and you know she's all about love 
and is is a a well done love deity that's not not just about you know the carnal idea of it. It's all types of love are good for her to help her. Not like Callistria, who's not one of my favorite deities. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good that's a good one. She's forgotten, I think, a lot. Yeah. I, th- I had a fun champion of Shaylin. Mm. It's a good time. Yeah. It, Cause she gets to she's a fun neutral good. She's not like a crusader neutral good, she's a fun neutral good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you go around singing songs, helping people out. And generally making the world a better place. Which I think it's a good time. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. So, I like those. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, when you're looking at popular media, again, that elves, I guess, especially if you look at the elves of, I'm talking about more modern elves, like pointy ears, D&D elves. And mm-hmm. I I guess you could say Tolkien-esque elves, but they're D and D elves and Tolkien elves are not actually really the same thing. Um, no, there's some similar roots. They tend to um, be characterized as neutral good. The surface elves, anyway, they tend to be characterized as neutral good. Uh, and really, the elves of Tolkien would have been considered more lawful good because they were very closely aligned with the ideas of of the Song of the Spheres and uh, Iluvatar's songs and stuff like that. So, that would be an interesting thing to discuss at some point, but Mm. for our discussion this time, uh, when you look at a lot of the way that not just, I guess not just elves, but the the sentient races in general, uh, like the humans, the elves, not so much the gnomes or... or things like that, but the halflings very much considered neutral good races, and that's be- again that goes back to the idea of neutral good is something that's very easy for people to latch onto and work with and, and appreciate and identify with, uh, even when they're pretending to be something else. <laughs> so, but yeah, All right. neutral good, a good time. <laughs> Yeah. Neutral good. Good for good sake type of thing. So, uh, I think that's pretty much what I've got. Let me see. Guess, yeah, da, 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 da. Imperial Lords, if you want to look for, at some of them for inspiration on how you would run mm. neutral good. Um, but yes, I think that's what I've got. Have y'all mm-hmm. said your piece on this particular set of, of goods? I think I would just throw out that, like Levi's saying, it's a good time, even though it's a lot of, we we all end up playing it at some point. That doesn't mean it's not good. And it's probably a good starter one, too, if you have, <clears throat> if you're playing a game where you're really wanting to pick which of the nine points you're in. It's a, it's a really nice one. Gives you flexibility, but you're still doing good. Um, so just because it's used a lot doesn't mean it's boring. You can still have a great time with it. Yep. Yeah, it's used a lot because it's it's nice to play. Mm-hmm. It's like I, if I want to, I'll venture out into some of the other alignments to try something else out. But I gotta be honest, it's it's the alignment I most like align with. <laughs> and nice. it just feels good to play. Hmm. Yeah. And it's easiest to play with... Uh, it is worth pointing out for you players that watch. It is easiest to play in campaigns when you don't know what the GM is like uh, for for their alignment system, how strict they are. You go in want That's to true. play... Because uh, you can play lawful good just as easy as you can play lawful... I mean, neutral good. They're, they're not too different when it comes to the goodness part. It's the whole yeah. whether, they serve, whether they think there's a cosmic order or not. Mm-hmm. So, right. Uh, and how stringent they are in you keeping that lawful. Right. Yeah. So, very safe one to play. I'll say that. 
in most campaigns. Not if you're playing like, I don't know, what is it? Uh, Hell Knights. Hell Knights. Yeah, don't be a neutral good Hell Knight. You're setting yourself up for a bad time. I'm just saying. <laughs> so. Challenge accepted. Uh, well, I mean, you literally <laughs> Lots of deception. Can. There's a... <laughs> There's a you, oh, that would be interesting if you could if you could pull it off if you played like a war priest or something who was pretending to be a hell knight. Yeah, it's lots of deception. Yeah. Although there's also a difference between one who has the hell knight class and one who is a part of the hell knight organization. Yeah, mm. but I think you still have to be an evil alignment or lawful alignment, unless you're yeah. exceedingly deceptive. Yeah. Well, then you're not them. taking the Hell Knight. You're no, taking that's my point. Else. That's why I'm saying, no, no, no. You are going into the Hell Knight organization as it exists in the world. Oh, you right. are not taking Hell Knight class levels. Right, okay. Yeah. So you would be a neutral, good Hell Knight. You, Just not a, a, a lore Hell Knight, not a mechanical Hell Knight. Yeah, okay. Lore Hell Knight, not mechanical Hell Knight. <laughs> I think it's a useful distinction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, love it. Comment below if you've decided to try and run a very deceptive neutral good hell knight. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how long you could stay neutral good while working with the hell knights, but you need a grand plan of why you're doing it all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you still start to run into the cosmic problem of, hey, cosmically, is this working out? or not because if i'm doing a whole lot of evil stuff just to accomplish a little bit of good it's no no that's why it's a whole bunch of evil stuff for a whole lot of extra good on top of that extra afterwards. good <laughs> where you like overthrow the hell knights make your new organization and like have this neutral good society you have built up afterwards the eagle knights take over the hell knights from within yeah something like that and it's like, wow, that was pretty bad. Did that actually work out? And you're like, I'm not sure, but it was at least close. <laughs> I don't know, but I I had a hell night of a time. Hey. Nice. Nice. All right. With that pun, and if Kane's watching, probably his groan. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm done. How about y'all? Y'all finished with this discussion? I think I'm good. Yeah. All right. I'm neutral good about it. Hey. I'm neutral about the whole situation. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Well, hopefully you aren't too neutral about it, Traveler. Hopefully you enjoyed it and had a good time. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Because next time, plan goes according, we'll be talking about absolute true neutral. And we'll mm. be discussing about what turns a man true neutral. We'll see you then. As always, have a great day. God bless and enjoy. Bye. 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 When you think about it, most language has a uh, has an aspect to it that's mm. revolving around the idea of your facial and other expressions. So a cyclops and its eyes, or eye, yeah, LOL. must uh, must have some influence upon how it does its particular right. thing. How's they gonna how's it gonna wink? Yeah, like how's it gonna convey a subtle message with a wink right. if it can't wink? I think it'd have to be the timing of the blink, quote unquote. Right. Mm. Like if you have so less long. factors to send out a signal, how you use that factor becomes more important. Right? Yeah, so the difference funny. between like a super quick one versus a like slow start and then quick or something like that could convey mm -hmm. different kind of ideas behind it where we do like one versus two right to show that it's like something intentional maybe the like the fact that it was like slow for the first millisecond like mean something similar mm -hmm. and it'd probably be something that only they would really get right that's what's wondering until you would got a textbook over-exaggerated <clears throat> for us.
or would it be super subtle or, or something? Yeah, it would just be cool to think about. Oh, and maybe what? a Cyclops could, like, super control the dilation of its pupil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you could get some real interesting messaging there. Yeah. You, if, if they could... And their eye is bigger, so you you could see it, and their iris would be going like this while they're talking. Interesting, uh, right? Kind of like a vocalizer while they're talking to their other f cyclops friend or superior or something yeah. like that. And so that dilation would mean something to them. I mean, we can't control ours, but if they can control theirs, perhaps that's they would be looking into different. Because the lore behind them is that they wanted to see, the Cyclops wanted to see its death, wanted to see how it would die. Mm -hmm. And so the curse was, or something along those lines, the curse was that, that they would only then see that. That's how, that was constantly in their vision then. They could, that was the one thing they kept seeing. Mm. Oh. So, or something, that was kind of what it was. Correct me in the comments below if this gets into the bloopers. Um, and so that idea of using that may, may indicate how far they see into the future and how much they see. Cause a lot of tabletop games will use them as seers. If they're not mm -hmm. outright evil and aggressive, if they're not outright aggressive, they are usually seers of some kind, usually into the future. Mm -hmm. So y'all got your neutrals ready. I think so. Got a Star Wars one. Because we've done Ooh. it every time. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to be a thing? I think so now. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, why not? There's so much existing out in Star Wars. That... Yeah. I mean, yeah, we we count the extended universe even if Disney doesn't. So. Yeah, whatever. I mean, I think they invited what? it back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thanks know. Disney. I think... Like, would they need your permission to exist? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I think it's okay that if you're going to be making works... That you decide, hey, while we're making these, these are the only things we're taking into consideration. Just because that canon is that canon, this canon is this canon. If, yeah. if you want to use it, make what you want. The if they made something good, I'd be okay with it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a very fair point. Start also the fight in the me, comments. Yeah. See you North there. Air I'll fight you on it. Gently and with respect. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there's five means. minute fan videos on YouTube that have way more story. Yeah. Anyhow. Core point <laughs> being, in this case, yes. they picked their canon, you picked your canon, you like yours better. Good. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> they pick their canon, we pick our canon, and ours blows theirs out of the water. <laughs> oh, I love it. <sighs> I love right. getting salty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, salt has savor, so yeah, I mean, savor the taste. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we get into too much more of that, we probably need to start yeah, neutral good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh.